Thank you very much. Our next speaker is James Mercy. He's the acting director of the Division of Violence Protection at the Center for Disease Control. And I'm glad that the Center for Violence Protection is at CDC and that this perhaps will lead us to a medicalization of these problems where they tend to get much more concrete attention. Thank you. It's, it really is a pleasure to be here. Um, It is a pleasure to be here. Um, it's really interesting to me, this, this panel is great. It's interesting to me that we have three sociologists and two neuroscientists. And Francis, are you a geneticist? Or what you? So it's this span of disciplines that's incredible. And I think it brings a, a really valuable perspective on this issue as, you, as you're understanding, I'm sure. I want you to imagine something with me for a second. Imagine that you woke up this morning and on the headlines in the New York Times, or, or if you turn on the TV and CN, the headline was that scientists have discovered a new disease. And this was a disease that affected children. About 60% of children every year were exposed to this disease. That those exposed were at greater risk for mental health problems like depression and anxiety disorder. They were at greater risk for physical health problems, even serious health problems such as diabetes heart disease and cancer, that they were at greater risk for social problems like crime and, and, um, and drug abuse during their lives, that they even could pass this on to their future children, the future generations in some way. If, the, if we had a disease that was in the headlines that was framed like that, what do you think we'd do about it? I mean, I really believe that despite budget de deficits, despite anything, we would do anything we could to eradicate that disease, to stop it. But the truth is, as you've already heard, we do have such a disease. It's called violence against children. I'm going to talk about, when I speak of children during my talk, I'm going to be talking about 0 to 17-year-olds. And I'm also going to talk about violence. I'm going to be talking about the variety of types of violence that Dr. Finkelhall referred to earlier, unless I specify a specific type. So I'm talking about the full range of forms of violence against children. So how common is violence against children? Um, if we look at our vital statistics data in the United States, our death data, um, data on, on mortality, we can see that almost 2,000 children died as a result of homicide in 2008. This is probably an underestimate. Nevertheless, if we use this even conservative figure, that means that five children die every day from homicide. 77 classrooms of children are killed a year. But I also want you to look at the relative importance of homicide to other health problems. If you look at all children, homicide in the United States is the third leading cause of death among all children. It's almost in a dead heat with the second leading cause of death, which is cancer. And if you look at specific subgroups, like African-American adolescents, 10 to 17 years of age, homicide is the leading cause of death. But homicides are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, the data that um, Dr. Finkelhor presented from the National Survey of Children's Exposure to Violence illustrate um, the magnitude of, the, of ex children's experiences of these victimizations due to child maltreatment, assault, sexual victimization, and witnessing violence. If you take those prevalences and apply them to the 74.4 million children that, that were present in 2008 in the United States, you get these levels of exposure. Now, some children are exposed to multiple forms of these violence, so you can't add them up and get a total level of exposure. But these give you a sense of the sheer magnitude of exposure to violence that we're talking about in our country. As we've been talking about, there's decades now of research that has been emerging and evolving, which talks about the impacts and consequences of 
this exposures to violence against children uh, throughout the life cycle. This violence against children can lead to, through the mechanisms that were talked about, the uh, genetic and, and effects on the brain architecture, can lead to social, emotional, and cognitive impairments, which in turn can lead to adoption of health risk behaviors, which in turn can lead to diseases, injuries, and disabilities, as well as premature mortality. There are literally hundreds of studies now, hundreds of studies, and I, every week I see more studies establishing and confirming these linkages that we've been talking about. There's been mention of the adverse childhood exposure study, experiences study, uh, at several points during, during this panel. And I think it's important for you to understand a little more about this study, because it's, it's the most prominent example, but not the only example of research documenting these relationships. This is a study that was done uh, between, with CDC in, in collaboration with Kaiser Permanente in, in San Diego in an HMO population. And it was a study of 17,000 adults in that, that HMO population. These adults were asked to give retrospective accounts of their exposure to different childhood ad adversities when they were children, including physical, sexual, and emotional maltreatment, witnessing intimate partner in their abuse in their family, household substance abuse, and mental illness, as well as the household member being in prison. And what, what they did in this study was to create something called an ACE score, which is the number of different types of victimization that they each experienced, sort of a measure of poly-victimization, in a sense, of the number of different experiences. So if they were sexually abused and witnessed their mother being uh, beaten in the household, that would be a score of two. If they had three of these exposures, three, and so forth. And they then link this to the health experiences of the, of the adults in this HMO population. So one example is the effects on mental health, in this case, depression. And what you find in this case is that those who had experienced <coughs> five or more of these adverse childhood exposures as a child were at five times greater risk to suffer from adult depression sometime in their lifetime. And you see this monotomic increase, this, this stepwise increase in risk based on the number of adverse experiences that you were exposed to. Depression is a huge problem in this country. So identifying a risk factor of this magnitude is critically important. And speaks to the fact that preventing violence is not just an issue of, of addressing crime, it's also an issue of improving mental health. But it wasn't just mental health that they found relationship to. They also found a relationship to physical health. In this case, you see the same relationship between having exposure to these adverse childhood exposures and cardiovascular disease. Those who had seven or eight of these exposures were at three times greater risk to suffer from cardiovascular disease sometime in their life. This same type of pattern was found for hypertension, diabetes, cancer, and a number of other chronic diseases. But not just chronic disease, also impacts on infectious disease. Here we have the relationship between these adverse childhood experiences and risk factors for HIV. You can see that those who had five or more exposures to um, these ACEs were at 10 times greater risk of having ever injected drugs. Uh, you can see that there was also a relationship with sexual promiscuity. Greater number of exposure ages uh, to these ACEs, greater number, more likelihood of having many, many sexual partners. And also relationship to sexually transmitted diseases. The same stepwise increase in risk associated with exposure adver adversities. Well, that primarily study primarily focused on adversities experienced in the home. We also know from other literature that exposure to violence in the community, both witnessing it and actually being assaulted or experiencing violence in the community also has a number of, of um, important negative effects. This is from a, 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 a review of studies on the effects of exposure to community violence. 
outside the home. And you can see there are psychobiological effects in terms of affecting blood pressure and hyperarousal. So suggesting there's some impact on the stress regulation system as well. As, as, also mental health issues, including substance abuse, antisocial behavior and aggression, as well as other personal uh, psychological factors that this has impact on. But also outside the home in terms of other relationships. Here are some of the effects that, that researchers have found in terms of exposure to teen dating violence. Physical injury, of course, sexually transmitted diseases, as well as HIV risk behaviors, drug abuse, smoking, unhealthy weight control behaviors, pregnancy, suicidality. So regardless of whether you're talking about in the home, in the community, or in relationships outside the home, we see these kinds of effects, when you, uh, negative effects when you're talking about exposure to violence as a child. Uh, Dr. McCune showed this, this, this same type of uh, information, but, and the research evidence really spans hundreds, literally hundreds of studies that documents these relationships. The evidence is stronger for the relationship between exposure to violence to children and some of these outcomes than others, but the evidence is, is consistent and overwhelming. Now I want to focus on economic costs. I'm going to talk about a study that we recently completed on the cost of child maltreatment in the United States. There has not been a rigorous study of the economic cost of child maltreatment until this one. This study found that um, the cost of child maltreatment, the child maltreatment that occurred in 2008 in the United States was $121 billion in lifetime costs. So those children, we estimate that were abused or maltreated in 2008, over the course of their lifetimes, it will cost society $121 billion. You can see that 70% of this is due to productivity losses, about 20% to health care costs, and the rest to costs to special education costs, criminal justice, and child welfare costs. Two caveats about this. One, we were only able to crudely estimate the impact of child maltreatment on, for example, health care problems that occur later in life. So this is clearly an underestimate of some of these costs. Secondly, we developed these costs based on the number of cases of child maltreatment that were confirmed through Child Protective Service agencies. If we, and which is about, in this year, about 800,000 cases in the United States. If we use the data from Dr. Finkelhor's study, one out of 10 children exposed to child maltreatment, these costs go over, over half a trillion, um, 500 um, billion dollars a year in 2008. So it's clearly a conservative estimate. Something else I want to show you is that we looked in the reduction of annual earnings as a result of exposure to child maltreatment. We found that when compared to comparable studies for obesity, teen pregnancy, and smoking, the cost of child maltreatment and, and reduction in annual earnings were more than the three of them combined. So even when you compare it to other prominent public health issues that are at the forefront of our attention in this, in, the, in this country, this problem costs a lot of money. There are certain challenges that we face in addressing this. I think the broad range of short and long-term health consequences and social consequences of this problem are underappreciated. They're underappreciated by policymakers and leaders, I would say, across criminal justice, health, and public health. We, don't, we haven't fully internalized the full implications of this problem. Something very important to understand that neuroscientists tell us is that the brain, brain circuits stabilize over time. So that the cost of trying to change things that children are exposed to at a young age increases with time. So it's better, as Jacques Schoenkopf would say, to get it right the first time. We need to invest in primary prevention. And as a society, we have not prioritized primary prevention. I don't mean when I say that we've invested largely in response through social welfare and criminal justice system. Those response systems are critically, absolutely essential. But it costs us more to wait and deal with the problem than it does to deal with it up front. 
primary prevention is key. Let me just conclude by saying that this is a strategic problem from a public health and a policy perspective. It's strategic because viable programmatic and policy options exist. We haven't discussed them. But there are many. Uh, Dr. McCune did show some, some of the interventions that, that have to be effective. There's many more. We know a lot, actually, about how to prevent child maltreatment and youth violence in this country. It influences many different health and social outcomes over the life course. This may be a weakness of this problem. You know, most of the way we deal with things are in silos. People deal with heart disease. People deal with cancer. This is a problem that cuts across these various problems, mental health and physical health problems. And so it, it's hard to get people to come together to address it as a whole. Enormous costs. You can see the scientific grounding of this research and what we're talking about, and I believe it's politically feasible. Let's just conclude from a quote from the National Scientific Council on Developing Child that the healthy development of all children benefits society by providing a solid foundation for economic productivity, responsible citizenship, strong communities, and a secure nation. That's what it's all about. That's why we need to address this. It's, it's that important. Thank you very much. We have about uh, seven minutes left for questions, and we'll address the first ones to you, Dr. Mercy, and then to the panel as a whole. at your pyramid, it doesn't include the prenatal period, which uh, I think Dr. Champagne's work and a lot of, there's a lot of research showing the impact of prenatal exposure uh, to adverse circumstances such as domestic violence and other kinds of stress during pregnancy, toxic stress during pregnancy. So I'm wondering if CDC has looked at reevaluating that and including that because I go nuts every time I go to these conferences and People are, they all talk about birth to five or, you know, whatever, and we continually leave out the pregnancy, which is seminal in the formation of a lot of the brain systems and a lot of the neuroscience and a lot of the systems. Well, let me say first, I characterize it as a public health issue, but it's also a criminal justice issue, it's also a social welfare issue. So all I'm trying to emphasize is, is also a public health issue, not just a public somewhat unique in that way. I agree. I, I work in the Division of Violence Prevention, so I sort of start with the violence issue, but you're absolutely right. But the data that um, Dr. Champagne showed on the exposure to uh, violence uh, during pregnancy was particularly illustrative of the point you're making. Um, so I agree entirely about the importance of the early period. I'm really appreciative of all the information I'm getting here today. I want to pick up on one of the points you made, though, in terms of looking at this in a silo. And I'm a little baffled also earlier, much earlier in the presentation, there was mention made of the White House conference. And I'm wondering how much that conference could pull together the different people and entity that needs to be involved in this conversation. I'm not intimately familiar with the White House Conference, but I'm sure that it did bring together a variety of people, a variety of disciplines and backgrounds to address the issue. But um, I think it's absolutely critical. That right, and I mentioned that because the Child Welfare League of America has been advocating for the last number of years for another White House <coughs> Conference. I think the last one was about 40 years ago, and how much that's very much needed now at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I had a question actually also for Dr. Champagne, um, which was uh, that your research focused um, for the after birth period <laughs> on maternal um, 
caregiving and not, uh, I may be taking that too literally, but I wonder about paternal uh, caregiving. Right, so in the animal models, unfortunately, most fathers don't participate in the care of, of their offspring and they have no contact with them at all. However, in species where there is biparental care, where the fathers uh, do engage in, in high levels of, of care of the offspring, uh, removal of the father or, or stress to the father can have similar effects to what we're seeing in our maternal model. So it's not you know, necessarily who the parent is, it's their role. Question over here. If you could wait for the mic, we'll be able to hear the question. So 3% of mammals have um, male parental care. Um, good morning. Um, I have a question. I know there was a difference made between the, the violence against females versus males versus, you know, whether, whether it's sexual abuse or other types of violence. Is there um, any correlation with children who have mental health issues or <coughs> developmental disabilities? And do you guys see an increase? Is there any study on on the specific violence targeted to those populations? Someone want to handle that? Yes, there are a number of studies that show there are higher rates of victimization among children with disabilities. Question in the back. I have a question for Dr. Champagne. Um, so um, you mentioned nature versus nurture, and I'm very interested in epidemic modification of uh, prenatal. Would you say that's nature still, or would you say because of the modification, you would say it's a nurture, and then because of plastic plasticity of the brain, um, it will continuously change over their lifespan? Well, what I would probably say is that, not to use the dichotomy at all, but it is hard because it's ingrained in the way we think. You can't really separate the gene sequence from what is going on in terms of laying down these epigenetic marks, because they can only be laid down at certain gene sequences. So really, it is very much an interplay. Um, and you know, just as a normal way of functioning, Genes require the environment to activate them. It's not maybe the environment we're thinking of, but it's you know the cellular physiological environment around the, around the cell. And so you know this is really just kind of layering additional information onto what we already have within the genome, to kind of sculpt biology in, in a specific direction. So it probably is more classically nurture in a sense, uh, but it, it is very tightly linked to these genetic factors. If I could. Uh, extend that answer. I like to think of the nature-nurture debate in the context of how do, we, as an analogy to how do we measure area. Do you have length and width? If you think that width is the smaller uh, length, if, the, if width is smaller, then any increment in width makes the area much bigger, but uh, length is the larger piece. So area, you can't separate length and width when you think about area. You can, they're always together, and I think that's how the nature-nurture debate can be conceptualized. The two factors, the two aspects interact. They're not separable. Question in front. Oh. Thank you. There's a question behind you. Um, this is for Dr. McEwen, Professor McEwen. Um, you commented on a number of factors um, that reshape due to the plasticity of the brain right. and that we can actually improve or recover um, from early trauma or stress, I guess is the word you use. I was wondering, you mentioned exercise as one of those um, mechanisms that work. Are there others, like maybe nerd like touch or other kinds of things that could work that help? Right, no, it's uh, very, I was just thinking about that point too. Because even though it is definitely less cost effective, more costly to do these interventions, I think those of you who look, read the, the article about Nadine Burke will realize what she's trying to do. Exercise is sort of the poster child of how a top-down intervention 
even moderate exercise can change the brain, improves prefrontal cortical function and blood flow, decision making, enlarges the hippocampus, improves memory capacity, and so on. There is a, a fascinating study from the Harvard Mind Body Center using a cognitive behavioral intervention, mindfulness, uh, and so on, uh, in people with a chronic anxiety disorder. And anxiety, of course, is one of the consequences that's exacerbated by anxiety and depression. And this is the, if this intervention is effective, that is, if people are responding to it, the size of the amygdala decreases. Now, that is consistent with the animal literature and what we know about humans, that the amygdala enlarges, for example, maternal depression, child depression, it enlarges and is overactive in people with PTSD, with anxiety disorders, with depression. So this is an example of a <coughs> top-down intervention that can, that get, can, in principle, change the brain. And, and I think we need to look for more of these. There are other examples, but that, to me, is one of the best that's relevant to this discussion. I want to thank the speakers. I think, for me, this was a very interesting session, and our time is up. <laughs>